Good evening. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of My Favorite Book. I'm Monica. I work at Bookland, and I'll be your host tonight again. You are watching the 10th episode of My Favorite Book, an, orig an original program of Bookland, Inc. Tonight, we're going to hear from Eliana Perez, who is going to present their favorite book that they've ever made. Before we get started, I want to acknowledge that the land from which we're broadcasting is part of the traditional territory of the Lenni Lenape people. Please join us in acknowledging the Lenape people, the community, their elders, both past and present, as well as future generations. Brooklyn Inc. is a nonprofit organization located in Brooklyn, New York. We are celebrating 22 years of promoting artist books as art, primary research materials, and tools for social justice. We distribute books by artists and organizations within the academic market. We host workshops and exhibitions, and we publish books in archival box sets. We're really excited to be doing our first serialized online program, My Favorite Book. This is a program where we ask 18 different artists to quickly tell us all about their favorite book they've ever made. So every Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday throughout the month of June, we'll have a, a new episode for you from 7 to 7.30. Um, you can check out our website for details. There is a full schedule that you can find. Um, and you can follow us on Bookland Art on Instagram. And lastly, I want to thank the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs for supporting my favorite book. Okay, now that's out of the way. I'm so excited for tonight, can you tell? <laughs> Two of my very favorite people are here with us and we're gonna do it a little bit differently than other nights. Um, so Eliana Perez is in a sort of rural part of Ohio and we're learning that Wi-Fi is not the same everywhere you go. So um, Eliana uh, recorded and edited a video especially for you tonight. Um, it's about 10 minutes long. It'll sort of stand in lieu of um, how she would otherwise be presenting her favorite book. Um, we do have her in the studio. So we just wanted to make sure that you could see the book in its entirety um, in case the Wi-Fi didn't hold up. Um, and then afterwards, we're gonna bring on Marshall Weber, who's the directing curator at Bookland, who has known Eliana for a very long time, who is a huge champion of her work and has presented this exact favorite book of hers many, many times. And, um, and he's gonna join me for the Q&A. Okay. All right, so I'm gonna do a quick, quick bio for Eliana. Um, but in the meantime, for anybody who's on YouTube Live, you can write any questions or comments in the chat for Eliana, and we'll get to those right afterwards. Um, okay, so Eliana Perez lives in New York City, born and raised in Colombia. She studied fine arts and printmaking at the Universidad Nacional in Bogota. She's currently working on a series of artist books exposing social and environmental devastation in Colombia. Her work is in the collections of the, of the Library of Congress, Museum of Modern Art New York, Yale University, University of California, Irvine, Bainbridge Island Museum of Art, and many others. So let's segue to this beautiful video. Enjoy. It's false or positive. It's important to me because this is the first book that I work on uh, Colombian issues, the uh, Colombian violence. I'm from Colombia. And this book confronts a recent uh, mass killing by the Colombian army against the innocent civilians. Before we look at the book, here are some drawings, paintings, and collages I made to illustrate the story of these killings. These ideas gave me a starting point for making the book. In the Colombian army, when a guerrilla fighter is killed, it's called a positive. This book is the story of the falsos positivos, the false positives. Even though this term, falso positivo, is widely used, it's not accurate because it suggests that the killings were honest mis- Hi everyone, I'm just gonna restart this. I think it was glitching for most everybody and I really wanna give it its chance to reach you. So just one second. Every book is false or positive. 
is important to me because this is the first book that I work on uh, Colombian issues, the Colombian violence. I'm from Colombia, and this book confronts a recent uh, mass killing by the Colombian army against the innocent civilians. Before we look at the book, here are some drawings, paintings, and collages I made to illustrate the story of these killings. These ideas gave me a starting point for making the book. In the Colombian army, when a guerrilla fighter is killed, it's called a positive. This book is the story of the falsos positivos, the false positives. Even though this term, falso positivo, is widely used, it's not accurate because it suggests that the killings were honest mistakes. Los falsos positivos were cold-blooded, state-ordered assassinations. For 50 years, there was a war going on in Colombia between the government and the guerrilla groups FARC and ALN. Thousands of people have been killed and displaced over these 50 years. In the early 2000s, the government implemented a plan to make it seem like they were winning the war against the guerrillas, the government inflated statistics about guerrilla fighters that they kill in battle. One of the tactics was offering well-paid jobs to poor young men and boys, but these jobs didn't really exist. When they arrived at the new jobs, far away from home, they were met by Colombian army soldiers who murdered them. The soldiers dressed up their bodies like guerrilla fighters with uniforms, boots, and guns, and counted them as enemies killed in battle. Army soldiers of all ranks participated in these assassinations and got rewarded with bonuses, promotions, and vacation time. There are 6,402 verified cases of this activity between 2002 and 2008. And this is the drawing that gave me the idea to have the linear format for the book, to tell the story in a linear way. I made this drawing with this line of bodies, and that this drawing made me realize that all the pictures that I have been seeing about falsos positivos in the internet, uh, they have a common de denominator. And the common denominator was a line. Uh, for example, the lines of the soldiers, the lines of the victims next to each other, the lines of the mothers protesting with the signs of their, of their sons. So here is the actual book. I decided to do it in a thin paper. I used Circal 100 grams and I used watercolor with a very limited palette. I also decided to tell the story in a very subtle and minimalistic way. I use these mods because in Colombia folklore, when a mod show up in your house, it's a bad omen. And that means that somebody in your family is going to die. There is a moth hidden in the cover of the book and it's hidden in, on the camouflage. You can notice this only like turning the book, depends on the lighting and, the, and turning the book a little bit and you will see that it's in relief. These are the page of the victims. And I put a deer uh, right there because I wanted to do like a parallel between the predatory hunting of humans and the animals. One of the things that I can understand is sport hunting. That's why I put a deer there. 
Uh, these are the pages of the trees. And I imagine this boy is traveling in a bus, seeing these trees passing by. There is an understanding. I'm not really sure what happened, um, but Eliana, I'm going to bring you on right now. Is that all right with you? And I'm going to add Marshall as well. So I just want to apologize. I think the playback was probably the same for everybody. It was frozen on an image, but we could hear the audio. Is that right? Yes. Okay, so for uh, anyone okay. listening, and I appreciate everyone staying and watching too, what I'll do is after, after we talk to Eliana here, I'm going to upload the video that we were trying to watch in its entirety on Brooklyn's channel. And so you can actually watch it st straight through because it's really worth seeing. Um, but for now, um, Eliana, Ugh. would it be all right with you if we just add the video um, of the images and then we can just have a conversation about the work? Is that all right with you? Yeah. OK. <laughs> we'll see. My hunch is that it was such a high quality video that it just kind of was too much for our, our little system to take. Um, so I'm going to introduce, uh, this is Marshall Weber, again, directing curator of Booklin. And, and of course, we already introduced Eliana Perez. Um, the book that Eliana was talking about was called Falso. And I'm just going to quickly hand it over to Marshall, who can maybe talk about the book. And, um, and Eliana, please add what, whatever you would like. Uh, yeah. Uh, well, I just want to correct you. The name of the book is Falso Positivo. And the uh, when in the army in in Colombian army uh, when they kill a target they call it positivos. So this is this book is about the false positivos, uh, Marshall. So Eliana, you you were talking about the moths and yeah. the representation of the moths, and we're looking at some of the moths here. Um, so I'm just going to ask you to kind of continue in that vein because I'm I'm. Um, it's so interesting. The moths are so delicate and so beautiful, and the way that you're working with this subject matter is from this very lyrical, um, elegant, restrained style, um, and it's it's kind of as if um, everything is symbolic of the kind of immersion into violence um, that is, you know, unfortunately ubiquitous. Um, in Colombia. Um, well, yeah, in Colombia and in a lot of places. I mean, I, I think that while, as with any good piece of art, while this art is exceedingly resonant with the history of Colombia and with recent activities in Colombia, um, it, it really is a book about the deceit of state violence in every circumstance. You know, it has very universal applications. Um, so I'm wondering if you can continue on with the story about the moth, because I think it's an important yeah. part. Yeah, uh, in Colombian folklore, uh, there is a belief uh, th that when when a moth is in your house, is like a, an announcement that somebody in your family is gonna die. So I wanted to start the book uh, with those moths. And I also put in the cover and it's one moth hidden in the cover camouflage. And you can see this, um, this, this moth in the cover when depends on the lighting of the, of the room and it's in relief, a very uh, thin relief, yeah. And I just want to continue with um, the use, the focus on these mundane everyday objects, objects, nature, animals, as uh, in, in some ways real symbols, right? Because the moth is a symbol that you're using, but it yeah. is also present in Colombian folklore. And then the, the, the really um, both disturbing uh, and somewhat compelling Part of the story is the issue with the boots. 
And yes, can you go and I, I some illustrations of the boots are coming up in this in, in these images, I think at some point. But can you uh, tell us about the boots, Eliana? Yes. Uh, when they kill these innocent people, they um, they dress them as guerrillas. And they put these boots, uh, the camouflage, and guns, and made them pass as they were killing battle. Um, these boots, uh, they become like a symbol for falso positivo. I, I uh, send uh, some images to a dear friend in Colombia, and when he saw, without saying what, what was the project I was working on, and, and he immediately said, is that about the falsos positivos? Because I I sent him the picture of the, of the boots and the soldiers and the mothers protesting. So I knew then like like they that was a a, a good way to tell the story. And the boots uh, they are like very messy when they kill these people and they organize the scene and they prop uh, uh, all the bodies with these uh, things and they uh, they sometimes the boots no, don't match uh, in number and sometimes uh, one person has the, the, the same um, the same boot like for the right feet in both feet and uh, and also with the guns, they do the same. Like they they put the bullets around the bodies, and they they said this is they they uh, they were killing battle, but the bullets don't match the gun, and the gun sometimes doesn't even work. It's just for a prop. Um, the thing with the deer that you see, I don't know why these videos are not playing at all. Um, but there is a, in this drawing is, uh, I made the dead bodies and there is a, a dead deer. When they were, the victims were alive, I put a deer in the center. It's just to show um, like a parallel. It's like between, you know, how they hunt these guys and how uh, they hunt animals is the predatory element that I'm interested on. So here is the the deer that is um, dead in the middle of this drawing. And um, yeah, that's it. So I wanted to mention something that I think is important um, in that this kind of gruesome theater is primarily performed for the media. Like the army is taking pictures of these guerrilla fatalities yes. and yeah. sending them to the newspapers in order to pump up their statistics. Their statistics. Well, not, not just with the army itself, but with the general public. Yes. Uh, this was the time of um, seguridad, um, democratic, democratic security in Colombia, the time of when Alvaro Uribe was uh, the president, and Juan Manuel Santos was the uh, Minister of Defense. And they, they had that uh, plan, like they were doing Seguridad Democratica, but they, they didn't, um, that, like they, they tried to look better like they were winning for the public, they were winning the war against the guerrillas. So they, the, the soldiers, the whole army, just the, from the very low level of the army to the high, the high ranks were involved in these killings. And, um, and they were, um, I, I forgot what I was saying. Okay. That's well, it. I have a, talking I have about a, Santos. Trying yes, to this <laughs> week it has been very interesting in Colombia because they have been 
uh, Juan Manuel Santos volunteered. He was the Minister of, Defen of Defense, and he went to tell his truth to La Comisión de la Verdad, like the Truth Commission. And, and this, is, this is a commission they do uh, when they sign the uh, peace agreement, like uh, the, the guys that were involved in these crimes go to the commission and tell the truth, like it's part of the healing. And he did his part, he told his truth, and he said he was innocent, and also uh, Alvaro Vélez, that was the president uh, in that time, said this week, like, the falsos positivos don't have anything to do, anything to do with the, with the seguridad democrática, with the democratic uh, security. That was, his, that, that was his idea and his plan. And he didn't... He said, I already apologized to the mothers of these victims, and, and he's not apologizing again. So this, all this is happening um, this week in Colombia. Is this a good time to channel a few comments to you, Eliana? OK. Um, so I got one from Antonio who says, this is a really important topic since the current situation happening in Colombia, mass, mass violence and authority abuses. <clears throat> and uh, Alejandro says, you mentioned that the falsos positivos happened during the years 2002 to 2010. Can you please elaborate a little bit why these killings happened during that time frame, which, which you may have already noted, but I thought I'd just share that. Yeah. <clears throat> They happened, I already say it, because of the Seguridad Democrática and that plan that they, they said, oh, this is how we are going to save Colombia with La Seguridad Democrática and how they um, eh, fake statistics to look better. And this is why uh, that happened in that, in that time. There is 6,402 confirm false, false positives between 2002 and 2006. And there is more, but that's the verified cases from that time. So, Eliana, can I, one last political question which might be of interest. And you and I have had conversations about this because it's apparent that many, if not most Colombians knew, even when the newspapers were reporting it, that the falso positivos were just that. Like, I, I think they're, you know, in the in the some ways it's very similar to it's a it's a great big lie, right? And in the same way that some Americans still believe that Trump won the election, maybe there's some Colombians who believe that the falso positivos were real guerrillas. But in some ways, it seems like the whole yes. problem was was more of an act of state terrorism, just to let people know that in any way being associated with social justice, commutarian, or other, you know, the traditional revolutionary groups that that was just not gonna be tolerated anymore. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> the falsos positivos uh, were, I, I, I gonna say this first, the falsos positivos were innocent people that got, <clears throat> they offered job for them, uh, to them, very well paid jobs. This is one of the tactics they use. Uh, made them go far away from their house, from their homes, and kill them. And, and they were not uh, community leaders or anything. What is happening now is like the, the killing of community leaders and um, is the fight for territories. And it's also about the coca plantations and the fight for those territories because they are strategic to the uh, exit of the cocaine from Colombia. They, they go to the rivers or, or something like that. And 
or used to plant uh, more plants in those territories. So they need to control that. So everything now is a mess because um, it's more messy, you can say, because the government didn't uh, honor the peace agreement. <clears throat> so all these uh, things are happening. They are being killing the, the, the ex-guerrillas that signed the peace agreement one by one. There have been 41 massacres in five months from January to the end of May. Um, and it has now is the country is in national strike. The police abuse is just crazy, crazy, crazy. And they have been hundreds of people disappear uh, in this um, time of the national strike. And, and, and of course there is how Marshall said, a lot of people that still support these, um, these things and the police and the army and the presidents and, and all that, yeah. I have a question for you, Eliana, that actually uh, someone from the audience has also. Um, and, and this is in their words, why after living in the States for so many years did you decide to work on such a political issue? <clears throat> uh, yes, I, I, I couldn't do political issues or things from Colombia before because I thought the, the situation was too close to me. Like it was too in too right there. Like, I, so I couldn't, like it was too present. But when they signed the peace agreement in 2016, I said, now if this is all these other stories from the past. And now I'm going to start to work in, 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 in Los Falsos Positivos. I wanted, I always wanted to make a book with that, but when the peace agreement happened, I decided to start. And now I just there, but the situation in Colombia is worse. So, but I'm going to, I'm going to keep uh, working on Colombian issues uh, from now on. So I want to thank you, Eliana. Not that we need to wrap up right now, but thank you so much for being flexible. Uh, with the unexpected tech situation. I actually think that maybe the video is so good. <laughs> I think that it it's really a high quality video. And I think for some reason, having me and you and Anne Marshall and the video streaming through it just couldn't handle it. Um, but for anyone listening who maybe wasn't uh, on the, on the, um, on the video before, I, I'm going to add Eliana's video to our channel uh, right after we get off in a few minutes. Uh, it's a gorgeous video. It says what Eliana wants to say about this book. Uh, I would guess in ways that maybe weren't accessible just kind of in the moment of flux when we had to adapt to not having tech. So um, I really encourage everyone um, to check back later tonight or tomorrow and, and watch Eliana's video. Um, it's it's great and and she did make it today for you <laughs> um yeah. again because her wi-fi is not uh so reliable in a rural part of ohio so uh thank you also eliana for going that extra mile and making the video um i want to give it its moment um let me just get a few things shared and then marshall and eliana if you have last minute um, thoughts, please add them. This is how you can get in touch with Eliana uh, or find her work on Instagram at Eliana Perez Studio or elianaperez.com. Um, Eliana is a fantastic artist and I'm embarrassing her, I'm sure, but you're one of my favorites. Um, your work is so important and I, I am really feel grateful for the opportunity to support it in any way I can. Um, Thank you. I also, Eliana. you're so welcome. <laughs> um, and also, um, I think, let's see, it's it's an edition of one. Um, and if I'm not wrong, this went to the Yale Art Library where it, it lives and thrives today. Um, but if you wanted to see the book, uh, more images, of course, check out elianaperez.com. But also if you go to bookland.org, we have it in sort of the, the, the homepage placeholder right now. And there's a full description and some metadata and a lot of images that you can check out. Um, 
Yeah, let me welcome Marshall and Eliana to have any last thoughts before we say goodbye. Okay. Eliana? Yeah. Last thoughts? Uh, no, no, you go ahead. Um, I, I just wanted to uh, talk a little bit about the fact that Eliana is um, in some ways a painter who w works in the book form because I feel she she puts um, a huge amount of research, um, both kind of historical and aesthetic goes into the work. Um, and it's almost like the, the, the paintings are distilled down into these codex forms and they tell these very complicated narratives. Sometimes there's text, sometimes there isn't. And um, it, it, it's very unusual, but Eliana has been making unique painted books for, gosh, I'd say almost 20 years now. And there are very few people who are committed to the practice of illuminated manuscripts. And I was, it was interesting. I was thinking about Eliana's work and, you know, usually I have these like elevator pitches I'd like to make. And I, I was thought if, if Goya had been, you know, born in the 20th century and identified as a woman, that would kind of like give you an, an idea of what I think is the, the nature of Eliana's work. Um, because it's almost mythical, like not many people will see the book, but I feel that there will be, and it's interesting because it's almost like we paralleled this with the actual situation tonight. But the concepts that Eliana are introducing, and she's done books on climate change in the ocean, um, she's adapted poetry from other poets, um, she's done work um, that will continue to address this issue of violence in Colombia. Um, the, the work is always so um, elegant and um, evocative emotionally, but um, so pointed in its political perspective and analysis. I think it's really rare. So um, yeah, look at the video if you have a chance and look at the rest of her work. And all the libraries that Eliana's work is in, like Yale, for instance, these university libraries and public libraries, um, you can go in there and, and sometimes they'll make you fill out a form for a reader card. Sometimes you have to call in advance to make an appointment to see the work. But in general, the work is always available for members of the public to view it. And with that, shall we say good night? Uh, good night and thank you everybody for uh, coming and please watch the video because I explain every page and the reason I made all the all these pages that way. Cool. I'll just ask Eliana and Marshall to stay on with me after we end the broadcast just to say a good night between the three of us. And to all okay. you people watching, thank you for hanging in there. Thank you for showing up for Eliana. Thank you for showing up for this book. Uh, good night. Good night. Good night.